Uh, okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Natter with Maka. And I have an incredibly inspiring woman to introduce you to today. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting this woman a couple of years ago and we've become besties ever since. Um, so Claire grew up in, uh, in the country. She was married at 18. Uh, her life changed dramatically when she was moved to Nowra and became part of the doomsday cult. She is a cult survivor, mum of nine children, wife, author, TEDx speaker, highly sought after speaker on resilience and courage, just to name a few. And she's been featured on the Today Show and Sunrise. So she's a mega superstar. Please welcome Claire. Yay. Thank you very much for having me, Julie. You know it's a pleasure for us to chat. I know, right? I know. It's good to see you. Oh, it's great to see you too. So 36 years living mm -hmm. in a strict religious cult. Tell us a bit of an insight into what was that like from day to day? Well, backing up a little bit, my life changed when I was four and a half and um, my mum went strictly religious. And because before that, you know, there was myself and three siblings and my mum and dad, and we were just normal Catholics going to the local Catholic church. And then mum found this, well, she was introduced to this priest who was strictly religious and liked everything pre-1962. So Catholicism pre-1962. And that seemed to mum just, it, it was a real comfort thing for her. She had actually been a nun before she got married. She was training to be a registered nurse in the St. John of God sisters in Sibiaco in Western Australia. And she reluctantly left because she was told she didn't have a vocation because she came out in psoriasis on her head. So at that point, um, at that point in time, that was considered a, a sign from God that she didn't have a vocation. So being married was kind of like second best. So, um, so obviously when she met Father Cummins and he, he said this, she, it's just seemed to, it just suited her to a T. So my parents uh, bought 20 acres outside of Ballarat and we like, when I went back there nearly two years ago, I didn't realise how remote it was until I, you know, because when you haven't been back home for a while, it's like, it just smacks you in the face, like, oh my gosh. So it was really, like, you can't even get a mobile signal. Not that there were mobiles in the 70s and 80s, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so basically, um, like, Dad dad liked the land because he came, he, he was a farmer at heart so he that that suited him down to the ground but mum had an ulterior motive and that was to keep us separate from society so that then she could teach us a purity of the catholic faith so we she chose to homeschool us dad was not in agreement to that he like he like right from the get-go he he involved himself in the local community in fact he got himself a i think it's 50 years a 50 year medal from the country fire authority um, in recognition of all those years of service. So he was a volunteer firefighter. In fact, well, you'll probably remember this, the 1983 Ash Wednesday bushfires. Mm -hmm. Was it the 1983? Yeah. Dad was part of that. He disappeared for three days fighting those bushfires on the great ocean road. But, and I mentioned that in my book as well. Um, but the thing is that, so for me, um, from the time I was four and a half, I was separated from society. I was taught to be submissive, that women were to be submissive. They were subjugated. They, that men were the head of the house. Um, priests were next to God in order of superiority. And like, ideally, one should be a religious, like for a woman, that would be a nun. If not, um, well, then you should get married and have lots of children. So my, the first part of my life, I was actually brought up in a sect, which was a breakaway of the Catholic Church. And I, so we were homeschooled on a mini farm. I did learn great skills, great country skills. I'm, I'm a great, I'm good in a crisis. In fact, I'm excellent in a crisis. I can, <laughs> I can bake bread. I, can, I tell my kids I'm like God, I can make something out of nothing, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't appreciate they don't appreciate the skill set but that's okay um so 
I was brought up like that until I was um, eight, well, not quite 18, because my birthday is in April. So I'd finished school at the end of 1987 early part of 1988, I left home to be a nanny in Caulfield in Melbourne. And then um, I had already, I was already engaged by my 18th birthday to a man that was 13 years older than me. Mum had introduced him to our household when I was not yet 16, because he was a failed priest per se. And because she was working, she wanted somebody to help her with homeschooling us. And for me, I became attached to him. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know what was normal. I didn't know that it was all kinds of wrong and weird for a 27 and a half year old to be interested in a 15 year old. I actually found out in 2018 that I was groomed by him because somebody else from my past had contacted me and he had, he had attempted to um, marry her when she was underage as well. Um, so I so I got married to him because I felt that there was no well I had this attachment and then I had no I had no self confidence I had no self esteem I had no tertiary education tertiary education was not encouraged because there was lots of new thought going on in universities and you know that that actually um, doesn't help the strength of your faith. You can lose your faith that way. So I didn't even consider going to university, to be honest, because I was also afraid, like, how do I interact with people like that? I'm not normal. So I got married because that was a safe option. And we, I gave birth to four children in quick succession. And I buried my fourth child soon after birth because she was born with heart and kidney problems. So that will be 26 years ago in May. And I can't hardly believe that. Um, then when I was pregnant with my fifth child, Tony, my ex-husband decided that, um, and it's quite ironic that you are interviewing me in this pandemic because when I was pregnant with my Johanna, who was born in 1996, Tony had read prophecies that something like this would herald the end of the world, as in we would all be isolated in our houses. We would have to store food, water, clothing. There would be armies on the streets, specifically Asian armies. And if we did not adhere to their instructions, well, then we would actually have services cut off from our houses. So we wouldn't be allowed to go out, set, it, set foot outside of our houses. Everything would be cut off and we'd basically starve to death in our own house. I mean, it hasn't reached that and it won't reach that. But it's quite ironic that <laughs> 24 years down the track, <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of come to pass. Um, but when I was pregnant with Johanna, Tony met this, he had this idea to move to the country. We were living in suburbia, suburban Melbourne and he wanted to move back into the country because of these prophecies that he'd read. And I wasn't keen because I'd grown up on a mini farm and it's not easy because you always, you know, your, your life is regulated by, you know, twice a day milking and, you know, when the, lamb when the lambs are being born and all the rest of it you know you've got to be there you you, you know it, it takes over your life and I'd done that I'd grown up like that and I just liked the ease of being a suburbs girl so I wasn't keen but anyhow Tony met this William Cam who had a supposed religious community on the south coast of New South Wales and he wanted to move there and I was dead set against it but because I could feel it was something not quite right about it. Like it just felt really, um, anyway, William Cam said he told all his followers that apparently the Virgin Mary, um, can give, you know, if you write a letter to her through him, she will give you an answer and, but you must follow the direction exactly. Otherwise you can lose your spot in heaven and, you know, all this other guilt tripping. And I did not feel good about this because 
I ultimately believed in free will and I did not want to be pigeonholed into doing something that somebody else wanted. Anyway, Tony decided to write to Our Lady anyway and the instructions were sell your house and move up to, you know, Nara. So that's what Tony did. He rang up the real estate agent and got them to put a for sale sign outside of their house and within a couple of months the house was sold. So this was the end of 1995, uh, 1996, sorry. And by February 97, we were up at Nara. And I just felt sick to my gut when we pulled up and the, there was just padlock gates and barbed wire fences around the perimeter of the property. And I just, I died inside, to be honest, and I did not want my kids to be brought up there. But having had a lifetime of you know, being submissive and, you know, the husband is the head of the house and he earns the money. So, you know, he has the say in where you're supposed to live and all the rest of it. I thought, well, if I just sacrifice a few years of my life, Tony will see the futility of it all and that'll be it, you know. So he'll want to move on, but it didn't work like that. So... I was kind of, I felt like I had a noose around my neck, to be honest. And you asked about the day to day. So when we moved there, there was 180 people. So it was February 97. There was 180 people living there. There was a prediction that, um, I'm not sure whether it was Halley's Comet or Kahootek Comet was supposed to be coming close to Earth. Um, William Cam said that the Virgin Mary had told him that the tail of that comet would hit the earth and knock it off, it, off its axis in early June of that year. So we needed to prepare straight away with um, food, water, clothing, um, black plastic um, to be cut to fit around all the windows because we would not be allowed to look outside of the windows. Uh, so we kind of hit the ground running straight away and it, and that really was it from the get-go. When I look back, it was basically preparing for the end of the world every six months for a decade. Did, and did yeah. you, like, be, believe that? Did you, like, when he said that, what, what was the immediate thought? Was it, oh, heck, or was it, I don't believe this? Well, the thing is that, well, people have asked me that before, and it's hard the thing is that you do, you, you've, you've got to think that I had young children and because I had been through a lifetime of indoctrination and everything being lumped on me, I hadn't yet found me, Claire, and what I believed and, and I didn't know how to sift the shit from the truth, so to speak. So I remember being instantly really, really anxious and you do believe it because you're amongst a group that believes all of that. Mm. It's kind of what I say to people, it's kind of like being in China or in North Korea, you know, where you just, you're, you're told this all of the time and you've got to remember there was no internet or anything back then. Like I had no laptop, I had no mobile phone, I had nothing. So you're relying on the information that you can get from around you. Yeah. And when you're just fed all of that, that's what you go with. And I had, see, I had no money. I had no resources. I had no friends there. So what do you do? And also we were not encouraged. We were discouraged in keeping contact with any family or friends or anybody outside that was not, um, that, that saw it as a cult that did not, that, that were not um, open to actually listening or believing any of what they were practicing and so we were encouraged to cut people off as soon as they were as soon as they said something negative about the group yeah. and so therefore and see that's a classic sign of these groups too is cutting people off from family and friends and i mean it's very similar to domestic violence in that way um and so you you know you don't have anybody to to actually talk to i mean we had a telephone in the, you know in the house but Again, we were told that, you know, we had to be careful what we said because the, the phones were being tapped. I mean, 
I know now that it's a lie, but at the time you believe it. Mm. Yeah. So what, when did it come that you made that decision? You got to get out. What point was that for you? Well, the first time was um, January 2000. So bear in mind the, the world was supposed to end on the midnight, first of well, 12.01 a.m., um, 1st of January 2000 because of Y2K. Um, so obviously there was a massive build up to that and huge anxiety on my part at least, you know, because at that point too, I was pregnant with my seventh child to be born in July 2000. And see, another thing, another belief of that, of that group that was constantly reinforced was that because we never knew when the chastisements or the punishments were going to happen, our children would be raptured and it could be raptured at any point, which meant that they, the, whole, the child would just disappear. So they could be playing outside in the yard and you turn away for a, you know, for a couple of seconds and the child is gone, body and soul, with no trace. So you've got to think as a mother... It, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. Um, now, so anyway, you know, it comes mid-January, mid, mid or in January 2000. And I had been noticing that there was quite a few 17-year-old girls, single girls that were having babies. I think there was two or three at that time. And we were told that they were mystical babies, you know, that they were virgins and that they were mystical babies. And I'd already got into trouble for trying to ask a question before I was told that I asked too many questions and I should keep quiet. So I thought, okay, well, you can tell me to keep my mouth shut, but you're not going to stop me from listening and watching. Mm -hmm. And so I'd sort of clued into a few things and sort of wondered how, and then it just all fit together in January, 2000. And I suddenly realised that William Cam, who was already married for the second time and in his mid-40s, was sleeping with these girls. Now, at that point, I only knew that 16 was the age of consent. So although I knew these girls were 16, um, I thought it was horrifying, disgusting, and I, I don't even have the list of words that I felt when I suddenly clicked it all together, I felt so angry. I wanted to literally punch his face in. I'm dead set serious. I could not believe the actual rise of anger that I could feel coming out. And I said to Tony, this is wrong. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to leave. And Tony said, no, no, he's got, you know, he's got permission from the Virgin Mary to do this. And I just like, well, not me at all. And I was always one to keep my kids close anyway. So I just kept an extra eye on them to make sure that, you know, they weren't going to be abused in any way. And they weren't, thank goodness. So that was the first thing. And uh, then came May 2004 and uh, Tony wanted to become a married priest against my will and without my permission. And I kicked up a shindy about that, which was not... Um, it was not very liked because how dare how dare somebody you know question what William Cam was doing and how dare she not give permission to her husband to be a married priest and in the end initially I you know I kicked up such a shindy that they said all right we won't do it but then I felt guilted into guilted and forced into giving permission. So he went ahead with it. He didn't become a married priest, but he was on the way to. Um, but then that kind of ate me away inside. So I began writing letters. So I wrote three letters in all, each containing three questions where I was challenging William Cam on doctrinal issues. And he did not like that. So I just merely pointed out in canon law and the catechism of the Catholic Church that, okay, you're telling us to abide by the rules of the Catholic Church, of which these are here, yet you're doing this. So how does that match up? It doesn't. And he just waffled on about, you know, the Virgin Mary has said this and the Virgin Mary said that, and none of it was rooted in Catholicism whatsoever. So... He had already been arrested um, August 5th, 2002 for um, he'd, be, he'd had charges of pedophilia brought against him. And 
so at that point, when I started challenging him, he was going through the court case. Now, the house that we were living in at the time, he was paying the mortgage on. So he was gutless and spineless because obviously he could not answer my questions. So what he did was he funneled the mortgage repayments into his court case. And so therefore that brought about an eviction in August, 2006. So it took about 18 months, but um, obviously I had no idea that this was going on. I didn't find out until afterwards, but, I I didn't have any resources, so I didn't know how I was going to be able to move out. And I was looking for every opportunity. So I tell you what, when the sheriff showed up on my doorstep in August 2006, he just handed me this wad of papers and said it was a mortgage repossession. And I knew what that was, but I didn't understand all the legal stuff in this wad of papers that he was giving me. And I just said, look, just simply tell me what I have to do. And he said, well, ma'am, you've got 12 days to leave. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I don't think, I don't think he'd ever had somebody so enthusiastic for an eviction. <laughs> but, um, I said, Oh my God, you know, my, my oldest kids and I have been looking forward to this. We've wanted this for so long. Believe me, I won't give you any trouble whatsoever. And I didn't. So he just said to me, you know, you got 12 days to leave. You need to find someplace else. So that was when I, actually was able to move from the cult so yes and, did, and and so did tony want to come with you or stay or what was that conversation there was no conversation because he saw he <laughs> saw the police car well the sheriff's car come up the driveway he was sitting on his laptop gambling and uh, he saw the police car come up <clears throat> and i called to him and said you know um, the police are here. Do you want to come to the door? But no, he refused to. So that's fine. I dealt with it. I took the papers into him and I basically said, well, I've got 12 days to leave. He literally did not acknowledge me. He just kept staring at the laptop, pretending he was deaf. And I basically said a silent F you. And I thought there is no way in hell that I am allowing this opportunity to pass by. I don't care what you do say or think this is happening. Yeah, And he, so that was the Friday afternoon and we had to be gone by Wednesday of the next week. And he did not, he honestly thought that there was going to be a miracle. It wasn't until three days before we were to move the Sunday that he actually started looking in the paper and, he, and I said to him, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, well, I'm looking for a place to rent. And again, he wanted to move way out, whoop, whoop. And I thought, hell no, this is not happening. We will be moving into town and we will be moving into a house that is more modern than what we're in. And the kids are going to have a normal life. I was literally not allowing him to take control whatsoever. But how dare I? Like a good Catholic wife is never like that. So um, he just basically retreated into himself um, because I was a bad woman um but anyway i was i was reveling in the badness let me say <laughs> um and so he had to come with us because we were obviously all living in the same house together mm. but at that point the marriage was pretty much well it was over we were basically separated under one roof and i divorced him in january 2008 yeah so, so then so then you um were you ever afraid after you left um, that anyone would come for you or anything like that? No. No. I oh, know. I was never. People have asked me that. And in my particular case, no. That's not the same for every person who leaves a sect, a cult, or a high control group. Each group is different in that way. In my case, I was fine. So nobody tried to threaten me or anything like that. In fact, I remember. One day I went shopping at the local supermarket and I thought I'd take the kids to Gloria Jeans for, you know, for a drink afterwards. And I sent my eldest daughter along to get a couple of tables and she came running back and she said, oh, there's, there's a couple of cult members there. And I said, oh, that's okay. It's all good. One of them was, a, was, a, was the priest. And I said, it's all good. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Ironically, as soon as I show up, they bolted. So yeah. 
I was good at clearing out spaces. (laughs) (laughs) So then how long was it before you started telling your story? And then, you know, you've written a book, Lessons from a Cult Survivor, Uh, um, Mm -hmm. that you can get on Amazon. Um, So, or your website, clairashman.com. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, how long was it before you decided, I need to tell my story and help others? Well, that came over time because not long before we had moved from the cult, um, I sent the children to Nara Christian School, which was a school out the other side of Nara, where ironically, ironically, we ended up by getting the rental near there. Um, and the thing was that they're a lovely school, they're Christian based and very community minded. And the thing is with Nara is that it is a defence town. So, you know, it's tr- a lot of the people are transient. And so when I started regularly dropping off and picking up my children from school, I would have, you know, the parents come to me and go, oh, hi, welcome, I'm so-and-so, who are you? How long have you been here? And, you know, I was just starting to come into myself and be more outgoing. And, but that you know, like that question, how long have you been here? Like, stop me in my tracks. Because what do I say? Do I say I've been in Nara for 10 years already? And then they would ask, oh, so where have you been living? It, it just it, it just is a domino effect. And so I tried to avoid saying where I'd come from because I felt humiliated. I felt shame about being connected with the group because it was never my choice to be there. I didn't want my kids to be teased or um, tormented because of it. So I was in a real quandary about what do I say? And then I thought it became all too hard one day. And so then I just sort of mumbled where I'd come from and, you know, sort of waiting, anticipating the reaction of like, oh, my God, she's weird. Let's bolt. (laughs) Um, But they didn't. They sort of went, oh, really? Oh, and they started asking more questions. And then I couldn't understand the curiosity. It's just like, this is a part of my life I don't want to talk about. I don't, I just want to put up, put it in a box, put it on a shelf, and I just want to be normal. And, you know, most people who leave these kinds of groups do feel like that initially. You want to be normal. You want to fit in. And so I just sort of, you know, gave out a few details here and there, but then people became more curious. And then I realised that they were curious because they didn't understand, they didn't understand a cult, a cult per se. They didn't understand the dynamics of it. They didn't understand why somebody would want to join something like that and how difficult it is for people to leave. And they, some people did say to me, why don't you write a book? And I sort of went, meh. You know, because you live your story in your head and you think, eh, no one else will find it interesting. But then it was, I did start it before I moved from Nara seven years ago. But it was actually when I moved from Nara to Brisbane that, you know, you know, when you either go on a holiday or you move somewhere else completely different, you get a different perspective. And it was then that I got a really different perspective and I had a lot of insights. And it was actually, after I gave my first TEDx talk in July 2016, that I began being contacted by various women mainly, but some guys too, who had left similar groups. And they were like, oh my goodness, you too. Like, thank you for speaking out. Thank you for mate, you know, for highlighting what it's like for us because we've basically exited these groups quietly and sort of living in our little corner of the world and we don't say anything because about our past because otherwise people look at us weird they wonder why we don't know the music and the fashion of the 80s they don't understand why we don't know people like you know the names of people like yourself who were olympic and commonwealth Games swimmers for instance you know what i mean we don't know the tv shows we don't know the iconic movies and so you know we just smile and wave and pretend when in reality we're full of anxiety because we're not normal. Yeah. And I thought, wow, so my story actually has value. I can actually help people, which is what I've been doing now. And to be honest with this whole COVID-19, I have had more people contact me and sort of like, you know, I'm feeling really anxious, you know, like 
and they've got all these questions going through them through their heads like I didn't like living in the group that I was living in and I left but were they right you know were the prophecies right mm. you know am I going to die out here is God punishing me like you know all of a sudden they're feeling like oh my goodness you know is this the end of the world after all and you know for me I've been out now like 14 be 14 years now so it's and that's taken a lot like it's you know there's been many layers peel away just as you think that you've finished with one one layer or one instance you know something else smacks you in the face and it's like oh my goodness you know and it just goes from one thing to another but I, I don't think that my learning will ever be finished. It'll, there'll always be another layer. And that's where my second book, um, I'm working on that now in that I'm talking about, so the first book only goes up until I left the cult. My second book is going to go from when I, so August 2006 basically till now and all that I've learned and how I did it because a lot of people do leave these groups, but they still remain frozen in time mm. and still traumatised and they can't get past it. So I'm here to help them be able to become normal, but they're normal, not trying to be like you or like anybody else that hasn't had an experience like me. It's about embracing th- that experience and take the good from it. And I mean, looking back at my, at my upbringing, yes, we were isolated. Yes, we weren't normal, you know, but, you know, yes, we were indoctrinated, you know, with a lot of religion. However, look at all the great skills I've got. I can bake bread, bread, cookies, biscuits, pastry, pretty much anything from scratch. You know, I'm pretty, you know, I can, I can cook, I can sew, embroider, crochet, not that I have patchwork not that I have much time for it now I can garden you know all of these things that just become that just come naturally to me and I tell you I'm really I'm really resourceful and creative in that way and I'm proud of it yeah absolutely you're incredible human so you ended up remarrying tell us a little bit was that daunting for you when you first met Mark and you know how did were you worried that you know history would repeat itself well i no, i wasn't worried that history would repeat itself because i'd already made some mistakes and again i will sort of <clears throat> highlight this in my second book as well because <laughs> it's oh my god i remember when i first thought about you know dating again and i was definitely not going to date anybody with mental health so i would actually ask people that i would like a, you know, have you got any mental health issues? Like I would be as blunt as that and I cringe now. (laughs) Um, And I wasn't going to marry anybody with tattoos or nobody that had ever, you know, was riding a motorbike or because they were bad boys. Um, And initially I was going to marry another Catholic. What was I thinking? (laughs) Um, But, you know, you've got to remember, I never dated. I never actually experienced romance. I'd never dated before you know and here I was at like 38 years old I'd given birth to nine children I'd been married for 17 years I was divorced and now I was dating for the first time in my life like I mean how backwards is that it's just (laughs) you couldn't get it more backwards than that yeah so my initial forays into dating weren't great um and but I always held this little fire in my soul that I would find someone And initially, ironically, I should say, I just about the time that I met Mark, I had, I was big into Spartan races and whatever. And I met up with a Spartan group in Sydney and we went out for dinner and there was this guy that wasn't very tactful. And I had been, I was talking to another lady who was asking me about my life and whatever. And I just sort of said, Oh, you know, I'd like to meet somebody. And this guy leaned over the table and he goes, well, you're attractive and obviously intelligent, but seriously, with that amount of children, you know, you're not going to find anybody. So I think you should just settle for a fling here and there. And I mean, it was brutal and I was devastated. And so I thought, ah, all right then, okay. So 
when Mark and I met on Facebook, him in England and me in Australia, it wasn't like I, I didn't have any expectations, to be honest. I, I really didn't. I just thought, okay, it'll be nice to have a bit of a chat, you know, just an easygoing chat with a guy, you know, it's practice, you know, whatever. And um, I didn't think that it would actually come to anything, but it did. So, but by that time I'd had some experience in dating. I knew more of what I wanted. Um, he does have tattoos and he used to ride a motorbike. So, <laughs> <laughs> See, careful what you say. <laughs> and um, he's not Catholic. He's not of any religion. So it, and I, fa I found that actually better because it's helped me to be more, I don't know, see things from a different, very different perspective, you know. And so that has been, that has been very different, you know, in, in that way. It, it's good, I think. So, yeah. yeah, but it was, it was initially sort of, um, daunting, I suppose, blending families. I mean, he has two children that live in the UK, so it's not like they live here, you know, with us all the time. But still, you know, it's blending families and it's not always easy, but I'm someone who likes a challenge. Yes, obviously. So you, you've you done, um, you did four TEDx talks in uh, a matter of two years. So you're, you're very mm -hmm. well thought after speaker. Um, what is it now that you, apart from the speaking and obviously writing another book, what else are you doing now? Um, you know, what are you studying anything? I am actually, I'm doing, well, slightly str struggling through um, the TAFE Cert 4 in order, to be gain a, in order to gain a score to get into University of Queensland next year. So ultimately I want to do studies of religion and probably sociology because my ultimate aim is to do a 50 cover a 50 year sociological research project on religion and my family like how you know how how my parent you know the background of my parents and then them coming together and then the effect on all myself and my siblings because I'm eldest of nine and then that effect on all of our children like you know like my nieces and nephews and my children so that's my ultimate aim actually because I for me I don't hate religion I actually have a huge interest in religion and spiritual beliefs and practices and I you know I've I've done already one single subject uni single subject from Charles Sturt and I absolutely loved that and there are research pro religious research projects out there that I would like to be a part of I'd like to be able to like make my mark on that you know in the world in the academic world in regards to that because I have a lot of information I have a lot of contacts you know growing up with that kind of background and my parents were very uh, they were the grassroots of bringing that group you know or setting it up in Victoria like encouraging the group to grow and all of that so <clears throat> I kind of come from traditional royalty in a way um, <laughs> so <laughs> And I discovered by accident that I'm not only famous but notorious as well when in end of January I gave a talk at the Kenmore Library and I, after my talks I always have questions and a young lady stood up and said, are you the Claire McAuliffe? And when I heard that question I'm like, mm-hmm what's that all about? <laughs> and um, she came up to me afterwards and I said, yes, I am the Claire McAuliffe. What exactly do you mean by that? And she said, well, I was attending um, one of the Society of St. Pius X churches in 2008. And it was actually announced from the pulpit about Claire McAuliffe divorcing. And I'm like, oh, so I'm famous as well as notorious. This is great. <laughs> so... The subtitle of my next book will be Saint to Sinner. So there you go. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. 
Well, Claire, you are an, a, a great person uh, inside and out. You're just beautiful. You're, um, you know, when we met, I mentioned before that we just instantly had a great connection. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if anyone wants to have a read of what it's like to be in a cult, get Claire's book, um, uh, Lessons from a Cult Survivor, uh, to give you a bit of an insight. And uh, I really appreciate your time today. You are an absolute gem. And uh, I, I know that if anyone wants to, I'll put it like this, anyone that wants to get in touch with you, they can by your website. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, thanks very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. It was good fun. Good fun. Thanks, Claire. Thank you.